Shavua uh, Tov. I, I thought this evening would be appropriate to respond to a, a, a recent speech made by Yuval Noah Harari uh, before what I guess was the crowd of the main demonstration uh, against the judicial reform this evening in Tel Aviv. Uh, because I think it's a, it's a fairly typical piece of sophistry and rhetoric um, that you get uh, from public figures such as himself um, on this topic or on a more general range of topics, but it's a kind of a, a useful jumping off point uh, for a statement that needs to be made. So what did Yuval Noah Harari say? He said, uh, reading a quotation from the Times of Israel, addressing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Harari said, we know you are responsible for all that is happening. You are not an emissary. You are definitely not an angel. After 2,000 years, we still remember Paro, and we will remember you. There will be no streets, squares, or airports named after you, but we will tell the story of the man who tried to enslave us and failed. Dot, 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 said some other things. We will not be slaves. Next year, we will be a free people. Uh, and so there's all sorts of references to the upcoming holiday of Pesach um, in that statement. Uh, and and so, you know, in some sense, you could just say it's throwaway rhetoric. Everyone's in the mood for Pesach, so why not compare Netanyahu to Paro, um, which is uh, a fairly silly comparison for a variety of reasons. Not to say again, I mean, I, I'm not saying this as an ardent supporter of, of Netanyahu's, um, uh, but there's numerous reasons it's not worth wasting time going through why it's strange to try to to make that analogy exact but i think there's a there's a there's a deeper point that can be made in in trying to understand a little bit better why this kind of sophistry or sort of empty or disingenuous rhetoric um doesn't land or isn't successful you know isn't isn't making a a, a solid point uh, and I think that has to do with the idea of why we think we're supposed to be sort of the good guys in the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, right? When you're a kid, that isn't a complicated question, right? You look at it and you say, okay, well, this is about our people and we were slaves and we were very sad and it was unpleasant for us and we wanted to be set free. And so we cried out to Hashem and Hashem set us, set us free with signs and wonders and there's this glorious finish to the story where Paro and his army are washed away in the sea um, and uh, Moshe leads us out to freedom and and that narrative arc is very satisfying um, because it seems to have a happy ending although we know actually what happens next is a whole bunch of difficulty in the Midbar and the desert for a long time um, but again like when you when you sort of end the story with the splitting of the sea, um, it, it it it's a very triumphant conclusion, uh, and it's easy to think in terms of just saying, "Oh, so if you want to make a rhetorical flourish where you say we're the good guys and you're the bad guy, and you're you know the person in power and we're the ones who are trying to, um, a, let's say, just be free," then you know. The, that comparison um, is an easy one to invoke, but I think for a variety of reasons, it kind of misses what the Torah is actually trying to teach us um, when it tells us about Yitzhak Mitzrayim in, in a fair number of different ways, but we can you know start with an often noted one that I think is at the, the core of this whole discussion actually um at some level so th th there is a, a frequent curtailment of statements that Moshe makes to Paro that's often kind of quoted in popular culture because it came through you know American um culture you know through songs etc that this is all about 
Moshe is saying to Paro, let my people go. Or, you know, Hashem says to Paro, via Moshe, let my people go. Shlachetami. And indeed, we have in the Torah, Shlachetami. But frequently, when that appears, the whole statement is, Shlach et ami v'ya'avduni b'amidbar. Send forth my people, not Sam, not just by itself, but that they may serve me in the midbar, in the wilderness. And ya'avduni, in that context, even specifically, you know, uh, seems to pertain uh, to not just general doing what Hashem wants, but specifically worshiping Hashem through animal sacrifice. And it, it, when when everything comes to a head at, at the the tenth plague, we see that very clearly because Bnei Israel are not allowed to leave Mitzrayim uh, with their livestock. Like, but they otherwise have been given the freedom to go. At the, after the ninth plague, Paro says that they can go, um, and and we're done. You know, with all the sort of uh, plagues convincing Paro that Hashem is mighty, and um, uh, it seems like they've already won. And then Moshe says, well, we have to take our livestock because we don't know what offerings Hashem will want us to make. Um, and, and at that point, suddenly Paro says, oh, no. Well, then in that case, forget it. And then we have Makat Bechovot, the striking of the firstborn. And, and there's something very kind of puzzling about that whole process because if we view this through the eyes of like the child or the sort of uh, the the narrative simpleton in the style of Yuval Noah Harari, you know, in the kind of comparison to the cartoon version of the story that he's trying to make, where the good guys, are the people who want to go free, uh, and the bad guys probably won't let them go free, there isn't really enough to make an issue out of because some people, you know, have in addition to everything else, some goats or sheep or whatever that they want to bring with them. Uh, and, and it both seems baffling at the level of, wait, you've been given your freedom. What are you doing suddenly haggling over, you know, a goat here and, and a sheep there? You also have been given gold. This isn't even about like having some material wealth to take with you. Um, uh, that's also going to be taken care of in the story. So what, what's the big deal about these sheep? Uh, and 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 yet also then Paro in his own way you know he's being stubborn in this way that's insane right he's already so convinced that Akandos Baruch who is powerful enough to destroy him utterly that he's letting them go without conditions he even tried to say like you can go but not the children you know there was there was all this lead up to this but he's really he seems almost totally defeated and then suddenly this obstinacy just leaps up where he's already said they can all go and then when Moshe says how about some sheep, then it, you would think that additional um, issue would be a small one or one that, you know, on top of everything else that's happened, it, it, it could sort of be tacked on fairly easily. But no, Paro says at that point that he refuses. And that's what triggers Makat Bechoro. You get the striking of the firstborn, which is on a whole different level, seemingly, than every other Makat, every other plague that strikes me time. In terms of uh, the the devastation, right? You know, ain't by change a myth. Like there the, the, there the, the, there was no house where there wasn't uh, someone dead, according to the Torah. Um, and and there was this great cry that goes up, right? The, it, it it's the the makah that breaks the spirit of all of Mitzrayim and Paro in a way that nothing else yet has done. Even though there was tremendous devastation beforehand in terms of their crops and people and animals dying and all sorts of things. So um, this uh, plague at some level <clears throat> is only happening because of the matter of these sheep or livestock that are, are to be brought for korbanot, for sacrifices. Uh, and uh, it is both kind of curious that Moshe is so stubborn about this and it is also kind of curious that Paro is so stubborn about it. Uh, and, and those are the things that I think it's it's worth ruminating about a little bit and trying to explain. Um, and, and before diving into that, I think as a whole subject, I think it's worth just taking it back into this original quotation um, that we're referring to, you know, delivered at, at the demonstrations this evening, because 
I think what it at, at the very basic level what it, it it points out that isn't there in in that as I've been calling it sort of cartoon or or, or children's or 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 all or too simple understanding of of what the meaning of of the exodus from Egypt is um what we're what we're seeing here is that the Torah is not just saying freedom good a political figure that is opposed to freedom bad and Hashem is on the side of freedom and on the side of the oppressed um in all circumstances no matter what uh and therefore they magically get to win uh the battle there's uh a again a sort of an a, there is an appeal to that kind of a, a fragment of a story and especially when we're children we don't kind of scrutinize that much and we just say oh yeah i like stories like that i like the story you know uh about star wars where there's the totally evil empire and the totally good rebellion and at the end the the death star gets blown up by luke skywalker and everyone gets to just celebrate that they've defeated pure evil and now they they somehow can have total freedom um uh because of this stunning victory that seems almost miraculous right there's an element of that like if you just talk about a movie like star wars it, it is an example in modern popular culture that 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 takes um exactly this kind of too childish uh fragment of the story about paro and it, it turns it into you know a, a, a sci-fi story um, and what's interesting there is that uh, you get in that example, you know, a clear comment at some level on on what the, the problem with this is, because the, the Star Wars story is dualistic, right? It, it it's it's actually a sci-fi story that is explicitly about, you know, uh, uh, some kind of Manichaean struggle between pure good and pure evil, and there's this association of the pure evil with uh the the use of political power you know through and 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 so i think star wars is not really worth going into as a text to interpret but the reason it's hard not to say something like that in this day and age is because we literally live in a world that has more or less received its moral education or not just moral education but i would say you know political education education and how to interpret history how to understand human affairs from texts as simplistic and childish and basically dualistic um, as Star Wars. And, you know, you have literally more than one generation that has grown up uh, not reading history and reading human affairs with sophistication that's demanded by a text as subtle as the Torah, for example, uh, which, you know, we can talk in a second about the subtlety of the actual Torah and how it talks about this issue. Um, but but instead, kind of imagining that um, you you just want to be the good guys in a kind of childish fairy tale or sci-fi version of a fairy tale in which you don't have to see, like, what happens beforehand, what happens afterwards. There's no realistic understanding of what political power is or how societies function um and 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 you just kind of uh, are are looking for the fix of feeling virtuous by being the underdog that is oppressed but is going to magically always win because there's some idea that somehow like you do have a god of some sort on your side because um how else could you defeat this all powerful force um that's trying to oppress you uh except because somehow uh you you have this belief that you're going to win because you're right so that that is uh the the sort of challenge we're laying down here to to this way of 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 looking at um the situation and i think the the essence of what it comes from in terms of what has been eliminated or removed from the story like we were saying is this this issue of the Yavduni, you know, and and not just Shlachetami, but Shlachetami Vyavduni. Set forth my people so that they may serve me. And 
you know, this this issue about the sheep that we were referring to. So what I mean by that um, is that <clears throat> the choice before anyone, and I think that the Torah is, is very clear when you read it all the way through and you don't just focus on this, the, like the children's part, quote unquote, um, of, of a little, this fragment of the narrative arc, um, the, what you see from the Torah as a whole is that there's a very complicated problem that all people face, that, that it's like an inseparable part of the human condition, which is whom or what should you dedicate your efforts to, right? Like, uh, what are you going to serve? What are you going to be a slave to? Um, and, you know, when, when, when we tell this kind of story or this fragment of a story now to children, it's just like, slavery is bad or serving being in this condition of servitude is a bad thing and so you know we were slaves in egypt but then we became free and the message there is that freedom is good lack of freedom is bad and we need more freedom um and 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 you know any instance where you know you have a situation where people uh, appear not to be free in, in some way um that's the 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 thing you know that that should be struggled against, and we don't think about what happens afterwards or how it got that way. What the Torah actually describes is that first of all, Mitzrayim, Egypt, is a place where people voluntarily make themselves slaves to Paro. Right? That before you ever have this whole thing happening with the Hebrews, you have Yosef in Mitzrayim helping Paro, a different Paro, but helping the king of Mitzrayim um, to buy and and enslave all of Mitzrayim, lock, stock, and barrel in the time of the famine, um, in, in this different generation. And so first, one, one of the things you're being shown is that there is something that's kind of a, a reproducible fact of uh, political order, that situations get created where people are subject to other people, or people where there, there are laws, or there are rules, or there are economic systems, whatever, all these different things come into being, where others are um, uh, participating them in them in ways where they ultimately end up feeling constrained. Uh, and it, it, this isn't just an issue of things that we, you know, um, would call kind of the classic definition of slavery, because even once you have societies where people, you know, have more um, rights as individuals, you still can look at their situation and say like, well, they're still serving something. They're still um, a, letting a system, letting a set of laws, letting a uh, set of procedures, um, letting the standards that they accept, letting even, you know, idols or gods that they dedicate themselves direct their actions. Uh, and and it really isn't so much an issue of whether it's called slavery or not, uh, because the the fundamental choice is uh, before everyone, what are you going to serve? And and I think you could argue that the thesis of the Torah is you don't get to discern, decide. I want to be free, so instead of serving something, I'm not I'm not going to choose to serve anyone or anything. I'll just be free. Um, that uh, that sounds like something one can do. And it sounds like something one should should want to do, but it doesn't seem uh, to actually be uh, possible. And 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 the reason for that, at some level, is is part of what we're shown when the people do become free from Paro and they go out into the Midbar, and and this time that they spend in the Midbar is kind of demonstrating in some ways um, that. It's it's like it's as though they're sort of lifted up in the air, and as they come gradually back to earth over the course of their time in the midbar, you start to see that one way or another, there are going to have to be you know things that people always need to worry about that are going to end up leading to um, choices that have to do with politics and economics and social order, etc. Um, that that are going to lead people to to pick one or another way of deciding what to do and how to act because they need food, they need water, uh, they need to be protected from threats. Um, and once you you start having those political and military and economic questions, then 
The question is, what's going to get you those things that you need in order to exist? Where are you going to get the space? Where are you going to get the, the means to defend yourself from threats? Where are you going to get the physical sustenance that's going to keep you alive? Um, and are you know are you going to get those things from Akados Baruch which is what the Torah is trying to show that it's possible to do through the concept of what's happening in the Midbar? Um, or if not, then where else is that going to come from? And what will you give in return? Like how what are you willing to do with your efforts in order to have those things? Because those are the things that they did have in Mitzrayim, right? They weren't starving to death in Mitzrayim. They weren't without water to drink in Mitzrayim. They very quickly start recalling all the things that they ate and drank in, in Mitzrayim. Um, and, and they also were protected to the degree that they were an asset that was part of an economic structure that needed them and relied on them. Um, now, of course, that was a deal that had another side to it that they ultimately decided they didn't like. Um, but again, the Torah shows us that slavery in Mitzrayim is something that people can willingly choose. And it's both something that many Mitzrayim chose when there was a famine. And it's also something that the Ivrim or the Bnei Israel ultimately are also kind of choosing once they leave. And then they're like, whoa, now there's no food and water. Or now I'm really scared about trying to conquer the land of Israel. Let's go back to Mitzrayim. Things were better there. So we're, we're actually you know, being shown in the Torah that there always are choices to be made about political order, you know, economic order, and you, you can't really get away from that, especially as a society, but even as individuals, if you try to sort of pry yourself away from serving one thing, you're going to end up settling on some other set of criteria for how to decide how to act. Um, and the thesis, I would say, of the Torah is that if you don't choose, like it was Baruch Hu, and you don't you know, try to dedicate yourself to him, um, and learn how to do that, then you will end up settling on something else that is a, a, an ultimately inferior choice that will lead down some kind of crooked path because it will be in one form or another, some kind of idolatry or some kind of acceptance of enslavement to someone or something else. And that, I think, is what is ultimately so... Uh, manipulative and childish about the statement from Yuval Noah Harari. I mean, leaving aside also, I think the utter disingenuousness of it in the sense that we're talking about someone uh, you could present as an example uh, of a, a, a public figure who in many ways usually is trying to undermine the idea um, that uh, we should be kind of learning how to understand the world from the Torah um, uh, in a variety of ways. But like like many, when it's rhetorically useful, suddenly, you know, oh yeah, Pesach is coming up. So let's talk about this like it's a, a frame, you know, we put on our reality that we think has some truth to it. But then of course, it's it's not really trying to learn from the Torah how to interpret reality, but more it's just saying, I know what argument I want to make, and I'll use it as a uh, as a tool to you know I'll, I'll I'll jam whatever square peg into you know uh, a round opening that I have to in order to uh, make it the case that uh, the Torah is saying whatever I wanted to say, right? And so, uh, of course, uh, he's not the only one who engages in that kind of an activity, but this is I think a pretty clear example of that. Uh, where this isn't any kind of serious study of, you know, what does the Torah have to tell us about political order and about slavery and about freedom? It's more just Star Wars. Uh, and since Pesach is coming up, yeah, remember the message of Pesach is basically like, you know, whoever regards himself as, as being um, the rebellion in Star Wars is the good guy, and whoever can be made, you know, argued to resemble... Um, the empire or whatever, they're the bad guys. And 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 that is more or less also the story of Pesach, right? Because um, Paro was basically, you know, the bad guy and, and we were the good guys. But no, that's not what the Torah is teaching us. And and the, the essence of that point is coming back, you know, finally to, to, to finish on, on this idea, this notion of uh, the, the necessity of 
the animals for sacrifice, that is the ultimate trigger of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, that when B'nai Israel ultimately are allowed to leave after the striking of the firstborn, um, it, that that set of events revolves around this idea of the sacrificial slaughter of sheep and lambs, both as performed in Mitzrayim with Korban Pesach, and also, you know, with the goal of ultimately doing that as part of one's one's dedication to Akados Baruch Hu, um, in the Midbar, in the desert, and, and carrying over into what will ultimately become the Migdash um, in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, so, so why is that? In the uh, in the, in the context of what what's happening. In Mitzrayim, when they're leaving, what Moshe says many times, and what we learn from earlier parts of the Torah as well, is that things to do with sheep and shepherding actually have very special significance uh, for the Mitzrayim, right? That it has to do somehow with their religion, basically. Um, that it, this is not uh, something uh, that uh, is just money to them, so to speak, or is just kind of an arbitrary kind of possession. Oh, like, no, you can't take your lampshade with you, you know, when you leave, or you you can't take your gardening rake or whatever, like other property that's useful in some way. The sheep are something that all the way going back to when Yosef is in Mitzrayim, we learn that it's this fareva to eat with shepherds. Like there's something to do with shepherds that's at the core of the, the Mitzri system. And we don't have to go deeper into that right now. Like I think we had other shiurim talking about sheep and the idea of sheep and what it might have meant to Mitzrayim. The point here for today is just that this has to do with the ideological system that reigns, that is, you know, the reign supreme in Mitzrayim and 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 who Paro, Paro is and, and what he represents. And the performance of this Korban Pesach in Mitzrayim, painting the blood on the doors, and the subsequent, you know, the demand to take the livestock so that they can be dedicated to service of Hashem in the desert, that ultimately is about B'nai Yisrael not just demanding freedom to go do whatever they want, but specifically the freedom to turn towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not uh, in this way, that's that's dictated by their preferences, but it's dic dictated by his commands or his expectations, and specifically to show that they're willing to do something that defies the gods of the reigning regime. Right? That that is a kind of blasphemy that takes the the powers that be and says to them, "You have idols on which you base your base your whole system. You have." rules and and conventions and taboos and what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take that which you hold most sacred and we're going to uh, blaspheme against it and we're going to do that because it's the command of Borei Olam, the creator of the world and that is the thing that Paro couldn't accept and that willingness to to basically go to Paro after everything else, and say, no, it's not enough for you to just let us go. You have to let us go and let us defile that which your society holds sacred because we need to do that in order to serve Hashem. And that is our priority. That is what ultimately caused the people to merit this tremendous uh, intervention in everything by Akados Baruch Hu, which with Makat Bechorot, like the striking of the firstborn, is this dazzling wonder that that gets to the heart of uh, Mitzrayim and 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 shakes it to its foundations, um, and is the most sort of open revelation of the hand of God in the events of the world that we're seeing in that whole narrative, and and the people merit it not because they want to go free and they are sad and their lives are bitter. Um, and, and so Hashem pities them and he does that. They merit it because they're demanding not just to be left alone to their own devices, so to speak, but to uh, they're demanding to Paro, in a sense, to be given the opportunity to uh, blaspheme against and defile his gods um, because they want to fulfill uh, the command of Akados Baruch Hu and and so to speak do the right thing, but 
the right thing not as is made up by their inclinations or appetites, but the right thing as dictated by what HaKadosh Baruch Hu, um, is teaching them with his Torah. So I, I think that that is, 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 is the place to close up this point is just to remind ourselves that it, it's very easy, again, to be the child watching the cartoon, to, to understand the story of Pesach as though it's like the sort of primitive Bible of uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the child-minded students um, of the human condition like Yuval Noah Harari, who basically are just looking at things through the, the Star Wars glasses. Um, but it's quite easy if you read the rest of the Torah to understand that that can't be the case, right? Because the message isn't simply that slavery is bad and Hashem never lets it happen in the world that he created. I mean, we know, because what we're, t- what we're told by, by the Torah um, is that okay, those Baruch who created the whole world and and everything that happens in it, you know, is is due to his will and all of the other theological implications of that, right? So um, we focus on the story of Ben Yisrael, and we focus on Pesach, on Yitzhak Mitzrayim, and telling a personal story, which as children we just relate to without thinking about too much. We think like, yeah, we're the heroes because we wanted to go free, and Hashem set us free, and. Um, they're the happy story for us. Um, and, you know, Moshe is our leader, and um, he talked to Hashem and, and you know, uh, settled it all, and it worked out well for us. But the question is, okay, so if that's the story, then what about all the other slaves in the world, right? Like, they didn't go free at that time, or, you know, there was, there was plenty of other things going on that you could call oppression that have happened since and may still, you know, happen uh, in the future, etc., and of course, there's an element of this which says, like, okay, but this is kind of a, a model example, and we learn some kind of values from it, and we generalize that. But at another level, I think it is worth looking more closely at the text and saying, well, okay, fine, but the, the affairs of humankind are complex, and they have kind of a, a natural order to them, and it may not be good that there is oppression in the world, Um uh, it, it, it and it, it may not be that you know our job is to be complacent and to accept it. We're not supposed to just look at things and say, "Oh, well, everything that's happening is the will of God, so don't do anything about it." But it's nonetheless the case that in the specific example that the Torah is showing us, the message is not uh, that like those Baruch who just wants more freedom for everyone all the time, where it's just constructed in this negative way of there's an oppressor, eliminate the oppressor, blow up the Death Star, what have you. Um, and then you get your happy ending. The message actually in this case is there's a particular people who were slaves. And because they called out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and because of this relationship he had with Avram, who wanted to serve uh, uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu through his family, a process started that led to a, a sort of a, a breaking point where people had a choice to make. They could say, oh, well, we, we, were, we were offered the chance to go, and we can leave right now without trying to serve Hashem, right? We'll just leave, and then we'll you know, go, go see what happens. Or we can create more difficulty for ourselves, in a sense, by saying to Paro, no, no, we're not going to leave unless we have a sheep. Um, and that choice that they made uh, ultimately, in the merit of that choice, one might argue, things could actually turn out well, because it wasn't uh, simply that they wanted to go free, and so Hashem has set them free because He always sets everyone free. It's that they were a particular people who wanted not just to be free, but free to serve Hashem, free to turn uh, towards Him and to learn from His Torah what it is worth doing with freedom, um, and, and to discover that true freedom comes uh, from seeking relationship with him and, and learning how to set one's priorities according to the, the standards that he teaches through the Torah. Um, so uh, we, we, I think, as, as we head towards Pesach, it will behoove us to remember 
when talking about freedom and oppression and, and politics and um, uh, the, the sort of affairs of nations and everything else, it'll behoove us to remember that the, the idea that you're opposed to someone having uh, you know, political power, whether it's a prime minister or whether it's a Supreme Court, you know, both of those things can have political power. Both of those in the eyes of someone can be likened to power. Oh, if all we're doing is saying, oh, look, there's a concentration of political power and that must be bad because I don't like it because at the moment it's being deployed against me. Um, uh, there, that you could obviously equally make that argument about the Supreme Court as about Netanyahu or about whomever, whomever else. Um, if all we're doing is going around and sort of looking at who has some power, that the Supreme Court has tremendous power. So maybe they're power, right? If 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 we're sort of being as uh, primitive in our thinking about this as um, Yuval Noah Harari. Um, but I, I think the point is that what makes us, what gives us the opportunity to, to, to uh, break out of that equivalence uh, is that there are particular choices you can make that are not just about removing someone else's power over you so that you can turn around and serve someone else um, here on earth or serve some um, overly simple ideal or idea, um, but rather to say you want someone else's power over you to be removed so that you are more free to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that is the message that the Torah is teaching us about Yitzhak Mitzrayim, and that's what we, we commemorate every year in Pesach, um, that we, we remind ourselves not just that we once were slaves and now we can do whatever we feel like, and isn't that nice, but rather that we once were slaves to Paro, and we made the conscious choice to insist on freedom from Paro, not for any purpose of our choosing, but for the specific purpose of using that freedom to serve Hashem. Um, and in the merit of that turn towards him, that was what ultimately um, uh, uh, gave us the, the wonders and the, uh, the might of the ruler of the world deployed in our favor to, to make a success out of what seemed impossible. And I, you know, I'll leave it to others or for another discussion um, uh, to, to talk about the question of, of whether it's the case uh, that here, you know, in this current uh, situation that we have going on in Israel, uh, there are uh, parties who are perhaps better described as demanding the freedom uh, that they need in order to serve Hashem properly. Uh, and uh, that is in itself maybe a long discussion. Uh, but it is, I think, at least obvious, I hope, uh, that you can't just go around name-calling people paro and making an argument uh, that, that deserves to be listened to. Uh, if you don't include those baruch in the equation, in the equation there and, and ask how uh, freedom is to be used and, and, and what, by what means or from what source are we going to learn um, what uh, is a, a good way of deciding how to act and what to do. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.